Hello and welcome to Insights with me, Lynn O'Donnell. My guest is Hans Jacob Schindler. He's the co-director of the Counter Extremism Project, which is a non-profit, non-government group that aims to pressure the financing networks that underpin extremist and terrorist groups, push back on their narrative and recruitment, and advocate for strong laws and policy. Nothing could be more timely. Dr. Schindler began tracking Al-Qaeda and the Taliban before most people even knew they existed. And now that they're back, he points out that it's the same individuals who've resumed power with the same intentions. There's been no change and there will be no change. The ideology remains the same. Dr. Schindler knows what he's talking about and he doesn't pull his punches. Have a listen. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's honestly a great pleasure to be on the podcast. Uh, as far as my background is concerned, so I started uh, with counterterrorism issues, um, as you do as an academic, um, studying in Germany, in um, Georgetown, uh, in Israel, and then uh, doing a master's and a PhD in international uh, uh, counterterrorism in St. Andrews University. And from that on with a small detour as an academic editor of a, of a academic journal on international relations, then joined the German government as one of the few terrorism analysts that the German government had at the beginning of 20, uh, 2001. Um, my remit was um, at that time, and we're talking really spring 2001, the rather backwater of taking care of a weird group in Afghanistan called Al-Qaeda. And, um, you know, what their plans may be, um, always under the assumption that, of course, Germany is not a primary target. Uh, there will be attacks uh, from Al-Qaeda already. We had attacks uh, on the embassies in East Africa. We had the attacks on the USS Cole in Yemen. But, you know, we didn't think that Europe and Germany in particular was a prime target. However, that also gave me a lot of leeway. So partially because it was a new... Uh, a position within the analytical force of the of the federal government of Germany, partially because it was very interesting. I mapped out all of the terrorist camps in Afghanistan, uh, pretty much from spring to late summer 20, uh, 2001, to see you know who is there, who's training there, how many people, where is the camp, to geolocate the camp, um, you know, just in case we would need that. Um, on on September 11th in 2001, um, the world really changed for me. Um, and I became very popular all of a sudden in the federal <laughs> government and beyond because I was really literally the only one in the Western world who had actually mapped out those camps and knew where they are and what they're doing in detail. Um, well, I don't need to explain what happened after September 11. And so my first trip to Afghanistan was very, very, very early in 2002. And for the federal government, I'd been frequently back until about 2005 when I got posted to the uh, German embassy in uh, Tehran, in Iran, with the remit to uh, look, of course, on security issues inside Iran, which at this time, as far as terrorism was concerned, was primarily looking also from Iran into Afghanistan. So I did that for six years, including some rather nasty hostage negotiations with the Iranian government, who even at that time thought it would be a good idea to take foreign nationals as hostage to make a political point or get some concessions out of European governments. And that happened frequently during my six years in Tehran. And then I left the German government. I had a decade of service and I wanted to do something else and join the private sector and finding myself again, um, because that was my expertise on terrorism issues, but this time terrorism financing issues. So advising companies in London primarily and big corporations on sanctions issues, financial risks, as well as risks of doing terrorism financing when you, for example, engage somewhere in the region, including in Afghanistan. That um, short but very, very big learning curve in the uh, private sector came to abrupt uh, an abrupt halt in December 2012, where I got a very thinly worded email from the German Foreign Ministry whether I may be interested in serving at the UN at the Security Council. This was the first time the German government was able to actually suggest a candidate for what is called the ISIL al-Qaeda Taliban monitoring team, which is the team of experts that advises the members of the Security Council on the threat posed by ISIL al-Qaeda and the Taliban and a whole host of other groups that are also on the United Nations Security Council sanctions list, but also helps the Security Council to design and implement 
global sanctions measures. This is, of course, a very significant post. And when your German government calls, then, you know, for a post like this, you just better don't say no. <laughs> and so I joined then after being elected, these elected positions, elected by the Security Council in um, early 2013. The team served first as an expert uh, for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. So frequent visits again to Afghanistan. And this time on the UN ticket, all parts of Afghanistan, wherever there is a province, there's a UN office, wherever the UN office at that time, UN staff, especially from the Security Council, had access. So I actually saw for the first time the entire part of the country, apart from the really nice parts. So central Afghanistan, no Taliban, no Al-Qaeda. Unfortunately, I never got to see the Bamiyan Buddhas and all of mm -hmm. the nice things. Mm -hmm. But from Uruz Khan to uh, uh, Nimros to Kandahar to frequent visits to Khost Kuna and mm -hmm. Jalalabad, I saw um, all parts of Afghanistan where things frequently made really boom. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, was able to see on the ground on how the war against terrorism was operationalized and how we could use global sanctions measures to cut off a bit more of the funding of the Taliban, cut off a bit more of their um, uh, involvement in the drugs uh, business, which I'm sure we're going to discuss at great length, and of try to cut a little bit more off their access to explosive materials and detonators. Mm. I did this until 2018, um, where after five years, you have to leave this post. It's an elected position. You are not allowed to extend that or get elected again. So I left and immediately joined the Counter Extremism Project, where I now serve as a senior director, transatlantic organization. We do uh, many, many things connected to terrorism, counterterrorism, and particular also to counterterrorism financing. Um, and of course, this gives me the opportunity to, again, focus on Afghanistan now, as I always say, with a very heavy heart and a feeling that it's back to the future on every policy discussion we have on this in mm -hmm. America and in the European Union. Mm -hmm. And in addition, I serve on the board of a couple of uh, research institutes and think tanks and companies, all connected with financial risks and counterterrorism financing. Okay, well, that's um, certainly very profound, as I said, and I'm very grateful to you and honoured to have you um, on the podcast today. So um, we we got through to um, the counter-extremism project. There seems to be no lack of activity in the extremist space to keep you and CEP busy. Um, how does the Taliban's return to power in Afghanistan change the security dynamic, not only regionally, um, and here I'm thinking about um, Pakistan's existential threat um, specifically, but, uh, you know, broadly around the region, there's a lot of um, nervousness, um, and globally, uh, what stays in Afghanistan has been proved not what happens in Afghanistan, I should say, has been proved not to stay there. Um, so your global analysis will also be, I'm sure, very important. Yeah, look, I mean, the first important point, and I never tire to point this out, is in your assessment of Afghanistan, you have to recognize one simple fact. We don't have the Taliban back in power only. We have the same individuals back in the same positions that they held in 2001, minus a very few who got killed or died in the meantime. The rest is the old Taliban government back in their future, in their former positions that they held until the beginning of 2002. So now we expect these individuals to act very differently <laughs> from how they did uh, uh, in the period 96 to 2001. When you um, say we. <laughs> the international community. Right? Exactly, so not you and me. Have <laughs> we have very, very similar debates to what I still remember in the in, uh, late 1990s and early 2000s on, you know, how to engage the Taliban, where are the moderate Taliban, who do we need to talk to nicely, mm -hmm. that things are getting better in Afghanistan, is it better to have an embassy or not to have an embassy, who's protecting the embassy, is the isolation, political isolation of the Taliban making it worse or better, right? Um, and there are always uh, similar reports. Hal Taliban fight drugs very diligently. Uh, the Taliban are now no longer connected to terrorism. The Taliban have nothing to do with any terrorist attacks that happen in Pakistan, although frequently fighters from the TTP who conduct these attacks or from the Islamic State ask to be transferred back into Afghanistan, which doesn't really show to me that this is a very harsh environment for terrorists uh, in that country. So I feel. We are back where we used to be, unfortunately, tragically, after 20 years of engagement there, most tragically, of course, for the Afghan population. Mm. I'm not surprised 
with uh, the Taliban getting harsher and harsher in their rule, closer and closer to what they did in the 1990s. I think we had a slower transition in 1996. They simply marched into Kabul and implemented the Emirate in its harshest form on the get-go. Now they have taken several years to go back to where they were. Now, again, women get arrested for not uh, dressing appropriately. They are already excluded primarily from education. There is no freedom of speech in Afghanistan. There's definitely no longer freedom uh, um, of press. There is still a massive drug problem. May have shifted from heroin to amphetamine, but there's still a massive drug economy in Afghanistan now controlled in the entire country by the Taliban because they are the government and hence also responsible for what happens in Afghanistan. We do have a other terrorism issue that we did not have prior to 2001. It's called ISKP, the, I, uh, the affiliate of the Islamic State in Afghanistan, ISIL Khorasan province, who very fast develops, and this is again back to the future, develops into the affiliate in the ISIS network who seems to be hell-bent on conducting overseas attacks for many years in the Al-Qaeda network. This was AQAP in Yemen until the Yemen war started a couple of years ago. Now, for ISIS, clearly this is ISKP. And if I don't count uh, wrongly, this is uh, we just on the 31st of December arrested the fourth time ISKP cell members in several European cities that mm -hmm. were trying to attack European targets in Europe. And that's the fourth time since 2020, which I call not good luck, but a sustained effort. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure why ISKP really is hell-bent. Um, on, on Germany in particular and Europe in general to conduct attacks there. But fact is fact. And it's now clear, and there was just a massive documentary coming out uh, two days ago in German, um, that these ISKP fighters, um, Central Asians, Tajiks prim primarily, most of it had already been recruited by ISKP in their home country and then sent to Germany, um, posing as refugees, inventing stories of oppression, to, to, to get their right to stay in Germany. And then from the get-go, had the order to organize and attack um, German installations, uh, US military bases, big uh, uh, gatherings of Germans. So there was both an attack on uh, an attempt to attack the Christmas services in several churches in Europe, as well as then again, an, an attempt to potentially attack church services during the New Year's celebrations. So mm. it's, you know, we, we are again, slowly seeing what happens if uh, the country of Afghanistan, uh, which has a massive basis and history of international terrorism, is governed by absolutely unreliable people who have absolutely ideological uh, uh, closeness to international terrorist organizations, mm. including Al-Qaeda, most prominently Al-Qaeda. But to a certain extent, if you really analyze who is who, uh, especially in the Haqqani network, including the Islamic State, but we somehow assume this time it's going to get all better. I would highly doubt that. Yeah, well, um, there's a lot to unpack in what you were just saying. I'm interested in the connections between jihadist groups. I don't believe the spin that we heard before the collapse of the Afghan Republic, that the Taliban are uh, purely an Afghan nationalist movement, but um, uh, rather are a closely enmeshed transnational terrorist led organization with global ambitions. Um, there has been a concerted effort by the United States especially and um, allies to portray the Taliban as a cooperative partner in the fight against Islamic State, especially ISKP. Um, as you said very cogently, the, um, the Afghanistan branch of ISIS. Um, do you believe this or, or is it spin? What's really going on? What, and, and if we can get back to um, Al-Qaeda as well, Yep. Um, the Taliban's historical connections to Al Qaeda have also been um, completely wiped off the the current narrative. Um, with even the U.S. President Joe Biden saying publicly, um, "I told you, I told you that we'd get rid of Al Qaeda, and the Taliban have done it. Then they're, they're no longer in Afghanistan." So there is, um, in my mind, a lot of fantasy about this. Um, can you go into the the details of? of where we are with that, the historical connections, the connections between jihadist groups and uh, the Taliban as the centrifugal force of that, and um, and and why there is, if you've thought about it, in that why is there this um, overarching 
denial that is creating an empty space for debate. There's no debate on this. Yeah, but it's nothing better to solve a problem by simply discussing it away. So that is the easiest solution politically to any of the problems that you have. Mm -hmm. You just may say, quel problem at the yeah. right? um, yes, So, and I mean, first of all, let's unpack the ISIS thing. I mean, what, really important to understand, ISIS did not fall off the sky in Afghanistan. ISIS um, in Afghanistan is only the one of two affiliates that the Islamic State actually purposefully built. The other one was Libya. That went horribly wrong uh, from the view of ISIS, right? They basically got, got eradicated by, through the tribes in Libya. But Afghanistan was the only other branch where they actually sent emissaries early on, 2014-15, into Afghanistan to set up a branch. There is a couple of reasons. First of all, opportunity. Secondly, competition. And thirdly, ideology. So opportunity was Afghanistan 2014-15 was not a stable country. Um, it was a country, however, awash with foreign fighters, awash with weapons and uh, explosive materials. So it was a very attractive terrorist zone to set up a new structure. Secondly, competition. Of course, in, since ISIL was, uh, ISIS was set up in competition to Al-Qaeda, you had to do something in the homeland on Khorasan, right? Uh, in order to show uh, Mr. Savahiri that you can, can play not only on your playing field and be bigger, but also on his playing field and be relevant. And the third one, of course, is ideology. Khorasan is really an important regional geography in the narrative, in the ideological narrative of uh, most extremist Islamist uh, um, ideologies, where a final battle will happen, right, uh, on the black flags of the, over Khorasan. So it's a really important image to have something called province Khorasan. And they built it up very much methodologically in the way they have done Iraq and in Syria. So they came, they didn't kill anyone. They actually mapped out the power structures in those parts where they saw opportunities in Afghanistan. Who are the power brokers? Who are the discontented Taliban? Who are um, the first most powerful and the second most powerful? Then they aligned in the first step with the second most powerful, fighting the first most powerful, turning then against their ally and taking over um, that part of, of the valley, right? So this is how they uh, grew in uh, Iraq and Syria, very deliberately, very methodologically. And that's how they did it in Afghanistan. That also means ISIS is not foreign to Afghanistan because it is consisting of primarily two groups, former Taliban and then Pakistani extremists. That's the two big groups that come. There are some former Al-Qaeda guys from the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan which split into two, one state with Al-Qaeda, one joined ISKP. But the two big groups are A, former Taliban, and B, um, uh, Pakistani extremists. Hence, also very good connections into Pakistan. Hence, the ability of ISKP to, first and foremost, also, of course, strike in Afghanistan. That, however, means that the Taliban have a bit of a problem on their hands. This is not a group of foreigners that they can simply kill their way out of it. If they push too hard, they will have further defections. And that's what we've seen. There's a little bit more on ISKP than withdrawing a little bit the pressure, a little bit more, a little bit less. Um, and of course, using the ISKP issue very elegantly in inverted commas to kill as many former security forces as you wish to do. Um, because you had promised not to do so. So you couldn't say, well, I want to kill all the NDS guys. But if you call them all ISKP fighters, you're good, right? In your own rhetoric. And who can tell the dead man is a dead man? You can't ask him if he's ISIL. He's just dead, right? So this is what the Taliban dilemma is. But the Taliban focus in its rivalry with ISKP is only because of the domestic challenge. They really don't care what ISKP does outside. They have not prevented one of the attacks of ISKP, be it in Pakistan, be it towards Uzbekistan, or very recently in Iran. And I'm sure the Islamic Republic will send a nice thank you letter for the bombing in Kerman a couple of days ago to the Taliban because, I mean, you know, they are in control there. Now that, that means that it's their uh, responsibility to make sure terrorists don't infiltrate to bomb funerals, uh, funeral uh, or memorial uh, processions in Iran either. Mm -hmm. But they don't care. Mm -hmm. ISKP is for them a purely domestic problem, including they don't care what happens to Al-Qaeda. They actually integrated all the Al-Qaeda fighters that were left. And there were more than a couple of dozen. I have seen these quotes from uh, American uh, uh, officials. If you, it all depends, of course, as I said, it's really cool to define your problem away. If you define the problem of 
Al Qaeda in Afghanistan means Mr. Al Zawahiri and his closest allies and friends. Yes, then we're talking about a dozen individuals minus Mr. Al Zawahiri who got killed, you know, as a inverted comma prisoner of the Haqqani, the only prisoner the Haqqani ever put up in the villa and allowed to drink tea on the balcony in the morning. But um, this is the smallest core Al Qaeda definition that there is. The Security Council has defined what it considers and Famously, the U.S. government is a member of the Security Council and permanent member as such, uh, what it defines as Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. And there are a whole lot of groups. Islamic movement in Uzbekistan, about 20 of them, right? Um, Uyghurs, Tajiks. So quite a few groups that are operating on Afghan soil. And all of these Al-Qaeda foreign fighters, right? These are not Afghans, have been integrated by the Taliban into their special forces, pretty much as it was um, prior to 2001, where most of the thousands of fighters that trained in Al-Qaeda terrorist camps that I had mapped out uh, in April um, uh, in April 2001 um, were not there to become an army of terrorist operatives. For something like 9-11 or the U.S.'s call or the embassy bombing, you need actual specialists and specialists that are willing, that are willing to die. And that's not that many people on this planet. So a very small subset of whoever got trained in Afghanistan was actually meant for international terrorism. The rest was simply fighters that Al-Qaeda trained for the Taliban, so the Taliban protect Al-Qaeda. And I have a sneaking suspicion that that deal has been revived. Again, Al-Qaeda's fighter are with the Taliban, fighting ISKP, fighting this national resistance front remnants of the old republic that still operate in Afghanistan. Um, and there must be some return for this because they're not get paid very much. So I'm wondering what the return is. So on the one hand, already we have the threat by ISKP emanating from, out from Afghanistan until at least Europe, Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, France, where people got arrested since 2020 frequently, not your lone actor who is in Germany or in Europe and then discovers ISKP, doesn't attack and declares loyalty. No, no, no. People sent very classically sent to attack uh, in Europe. So that we have already. And then, of course, after Europe is the big brother, usually. So um, I don't think that the American homeland will be safe forever. At the moment, it seems safer. In that case, the American administration is right. Um, there is not yet a clear and present danger to the U.S. homeland. Um, but, uh, of course, these uh, attacks, in part, were trying to attack U.S. military installations in Europe. So there is certainly a threat to U.S. interests already outside the U.S. homeland. And yet, um, as I alluded to before, there is a wholesale denial um, of these aspects that you're talking about in detail, um, as well as an overall problem at all. And, and it's not just um, quel problème. It is there is no problem, not what problem. There, there isn't a problem. We've dealt with the problem. The Taliban have helped us deal with al-Qaeda and, um, and ISIS. Um, that is patently not true. Um, I hear from um, other people that I talk to about these issues that al-Qaeda is embedded in the administrative structure of the Taliban now running um, Afghanistan in various ministries, but also um, as back in the day, uh, running training camps as well for fighters with um, the possibility that I, I haven't yet um, put my uh, hand on in, in a very tight grip, that they are also helping other um, jihadist organisations um, do their worst in places like Gaza um, and a, as well as northwest uh, Pakistan and possibly elsewhere as well. Have you, um, have you um, come across evidence that that is the case? Look, I mean, Al-Qaeda fighters were always in a training and assist position between 2002 and 2021 with the Taliban. So this is not new. Um, they were the specialists who taught the IED building, who taught strategy and tactics to Taliban fighters. So this is actually only the formalization of something that was going on until uh, August 2021 already. I've not yet seen any connections, direct connections to Gaza. But clearly, it is undeniable. If you look at the number of attacks, that especially the tribal areas in Pakistan saw a more than 100% increase in attacks since every year, since uh, August 2021. 
primarily conducted by the TTP, which the Security Council counts to the wider Al-Qaeda network, yeah. which has very, very close connections to the Taliban via the Akali network, who act as some kind of a go between between the Tariqa Taliban Pakistan, which is the Pakistani version of the Taliban that want to actually remove the government in Islamabad. And the Haqqani network of the Afghan Taliban is somewhat the going between between the Pakistan government, including the ISI, and that is saying a lot, mm. and TTP, mm. right? So, and there were numerous, numerous uh, attempts to take hostages where the TTP hostage taker actually specifically asked to leave Pakistan direction Afghanistan as a safe haven. So for Pakistan, this is, I think, the celebrations that we saw in Islamabad when the Taliban took over in August 2021 um, have died down very quickly and very distinctly um, because, as usual, as the neighboring country, Pakistan and Iran are the first ones to have the problem and even more so Pakistan. So I'm quite sure um, there may be some strategic rethinking on the um, on the um, usefulness of being so close to the Taliban for 20 years when as soon as they're back in power, your pro the problems get hit uh, you get hit with the same problems that you had before. No change is despite 20 years of real actual support against the international community, against U.S. interests. I, I, if I would be in Islamabad, I would be extremely angry with my friends. Well, Islam. yeah, um, um, that old saying, what goes around comes around, is certainly coming back around to, to Pakistan. We didn't get around to why the denial um, mm -hmm. When, when uh, President Biden says um, nothing to say here, the mainstream media worldwide says, thank you, sir, nothing to see here, even though um, projects like the counter-extremism project, yours, the uh, United uh, Nations Security Council, the analytical um, folk are doing really granular work on, on this. There is no excuse for not knowing. So I'm, what I'm really... Um, interested in is why the denial look here i have to speculate because i mean obviously um there is a reason right um a um you always have this very long held tradition and it started very early on in our engagement in afghanistan that you construct political comfort narratives because we have made so much effort, because we spend so much money, because we spend so much of our own blood and unfortunately also Afghan blood, it cannot have resulted in nothing. So that is a problem. That was always a problem in Afghanistan. I think it was far too large a budget and far too small a force. Um, and therefore, everyone on the ground was always reporting. I mean, we, we actually, we won ourselves to death in Afghanistan. There was never anything that went wrong. If you read through the vast majority of political and uh, diplomatic reporting out of the country over the last 20 years, because it was so expensive, it was so big. Mm. How could you say this is all go wrong, right? And I think this is still one of these mechanisms that you say, okay, we have a lot of egg on our face because as it was pretty obvious, our um, the way the withdrawal was organized by pretty much every single country that did it in Afghanistan. It, it, this was not a orderly and um, rational withdrawal. Um, it was pretty chaotic. Yeah. Um, it also uh, resulted in, as I said, the same individuals being back in power that we threw out at the end of uh, 2001. So very obviously, there is a bit of a political problem that you did, a, you know, 360 degree and you ended up where you started thing after spending trillions of dollars. So there must be some success. The Taliban must be any way better than they were 20 years ago. There must be some positive aspects that we can leave with, because certainly it's already very obvious Afghans, in particular Afghan women, do not have any success after 20 years. For them, their dreams their aspirations, their future is gone. I mean, sustainably gone because the Taliban are not going to, they're not even interested in building a prosperous and peaceful Afghanistan. That's not what the ideology says. It's really not a fight. Um, so we need to find something that is positive. Right. And so, well, objectively speaking, where is the Al-Qaeda terror attack? out of Afghanistan until now. We have massive Al-Qaeda operations and hundreds of attacks in Africa. We have a couple of Al-Qaeda operations in the Middle East. We have so far not yet 
uh, Al-Qaeda operation emanating throughout from Afghanistan. I would add it always took a couple of years. Uh, Al-Qaeda has learned. Um, the Taliban don't want to be embarrassed at this point by Al-Qaeda because they're still pressuring the international community to get to the big money, i.e. a seat at the UN, access to the full UN funds, not the emergency funds, get rid of the international sanction system uh, that the international community put in place to make sure that the Taliban don't finance terrorism. That's what they want. The last thing the Taliban at the moment need is a juicy big Al-Qaeda attack that was planned in Afghanistan. That, however, will, that hope that they're going to get all of this, I think will die a slow but certain death. And then the cards are off the table again. So until that time, you can conveniently say, okay, nothing to see here. My argument, the argument of, of CEP and others is, of course, well, there is still something to see if the only thing that prevents Al-Qaeda from operating, they are super safe now, no drone attacks, no international forces, no Republican forces in Afghanistan. No one is bothering these guys. They have not changed their ideology. The Taliban have never, ever, ever promised to separate from Al-Qaeda. The Doha agreement says we are only preventing Afghanistan to be used for attacks abroad. That is such a broad formulation that I can think of at least five scenarios where you can plan an terror attack in Afghanistan and the Taliban can say nothing to do with us, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so um, only thing that stands between us and Al-Qaeda being active in Afghanistan at this point again in planning international attacks is the Taliban potentially telling them, hold on, this is not what we need right now. Once they no certainly longer see in that their interest. Yeah, but it's well, certainly in, in the Taliban's interest to maintain the patience that they demonstrated over the course of 20 years. I mean, wasn't it not Osama bin Laden's vision that Afghanistan becomes the centre of the global caliphate? We're almost yeah, look, I mean, the, the really sad story here is, and, and in West Africa we see a very similar situation, in East Africa we may see it this year, is that if you think about what were the basic arguments that Osama bin Laden made, the innovation of Al-Qaeda in the methodology of terrorism, right? So the Muslim Brotherhood says we need to Islamicize society from the individual bottom up. Then came the first generation of Islamists who said, no, 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 no. So e Egyptian Islamic Jihad, we have to have a revolutionary movement. We remove the government of the Muslim states and then we Islamicize from the top down. And Al-Qaeda says both is not going to work because your governments in the Islamic states are supported and propped up and protected by the big European and US powers. Unless they get out of the region, we have absolutely no chance of doing either the bottom up or the top down approach. We need to get rid of them first. How do we get rid of them? Not by direct military confrontation, by trip, trip, terror attacks, terror attacks, terror attacks to make them politically, financially and militarily tired mm -hmm. so that they will leave on their own. Well, I would say this is exactly what happened in August 2021. Like to the dot, what Osama bin Laden predicted we would do if he just puts enough terrorism pressure on us. We simply get tired. We hadn't lost militarily. There was no need for us to withdraw because our troops would be killed the next day. We actually were in a good position. So was the Republic if we would continue to help her. We were just physically, financially and definitely politically tired with this war and left. And then the same day, even the day before we left, right, the government fell. Same thing in West Africa is happening right now, right? Mm -hmm. So in the eyes of the Al-Qaeda and global Islamist community, this is actually the narrative coming true. It's very dangerous because we think we defeated Al uh, the ISIS in 2019 in Iraq and Syria. We defeated Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. That's our narrative, right? We think we won. Or from their perspective, they are winning because what was predicted, we do, right? And we're now removing our forces from West Africa. Again, enough terrorism. Sooner or later, they will leave because it's just too costly, too cumbersome to do that. So we'll withdraw our forces. So we're actually in a, in a situation where, from an Islamist perspective, the last three years has been the most glorious ever.
Um, well, part of the, um, the the denial of reality, if you like, is about uh, drugs, the biggest source of financing for the Taliban's operations for decades. Uh, you know an awful lot about that. And in recent months, I would imagine that a lot of our listeners have also noticed that there's been a lot of excitement about the apparent ban by the Taliban on the planting of poppy for the production of heroin. Um, you and I have had some conversations about this, and one thing I recall you saying is that there has never been a Taliban without drugs, even during that aberrational one-year ban in 2000. Stockpiles were enormous, and they still are, but I rarely see in all of the... Um, excitable uh, coverage of the poppy ban and its success, any mention of quantifiable stockpiles, who has them, the trade, the price rises, um, any of that. Um, but you know about this and um, I, I'm very interested to hear your analysis of what's going on, um, uh, what's the motivation for cutting poppy production um, and where do, where do they go from here? I cannot see the Taliban the richest criminal cartel in the world, if I may posit that, um, cutting off the greatest source of their funding. Exactly. So it would basically, basically be saying the Medellin cartel lost interest in producing heroin, right, for North America. Mm -hmm. um, that's not likely to happen. So what we were able to do at the Security Council is that when we looked at the self-published biographies of some of the Taliban leaders, not stuff people wrote about them, but stuff they wrote about themselves, it became very clear that even before the Taliban were founded as a movement, they had seed funding from three Nurzai drug networks in Afghanistan, which is not unusual in Afghanistan. What else is there in the economy that generates a lot of money? There is a lot of natural resources, but there's no infrastructure to exploit it. So really, the only big, fast money that you can do in Afghanistan over the last 40 years was drugs. <laughs> so they got seed money. So much so that the last American prisoner that the Taliban held was released um, in exchange for Hachi Bashir Nurzai, the one of the three, the head of one of the three drug networks that gave them money in the early 1990s to found the Taliban movement. Although he's been in prison in America since 2005, so he really couldn't do any favors to the Taliban for 16 years yet. The last American hostage was uh, was exchanged for him. That shows how deeply thankful the Taliban were to this drug dealer. He's not an ideology. He's just a drug dealer in Afghanistan, a big one. Yeah. Right. So that's number one. Number two, um, we had this story before. Again, the Taliban need to be good guys. That's the political narrative where we need to get to. And so demonstrating a couple of uh, poppy fields being eradicated is always a good thing for the Taliban to do. Who knows how many of those poppy fields are rad eradicated because this is a drug network that is actually not under the control of the Taliban versus another drug work network that has their poppy fields, which is under control of the Taliban, whose fields are not eradicated. Clearly, production has gone down. I just wanted to mention heroin was never cheaper than in the last two years. So there is a bit of a pricing problem on the global market, and this could very well, as it was in the early 2000s, a price adjustment measure where we had already a poppy ban by uh, um, um, then Mullah Omar, who said three times, right, please, you know, we don't do dealing in trucks, um, eradicate the poppies, plow the poppies under. And the first two times he said that actually increased poppy production. And only the last time it actually, when the, the market price really threw through over production worldwide, was really plummeting. Then it had an effect for about 12 months. We don't know how long they would have sustained that because shortly after that, uh, uh, the international community invaded Afghanistan at the end of 2001. So proof in the pudding is still uh, was not possible. Now we have a similar situation, but we also have something else. And I know there was a lot of criticism of the UNODC report on this issue, um, which is called um, the switch um, to a new drug in Afghanistan, uh, a chemical drug, uh, amphetamine. Myth, essentially. Um, the one advantage that you have in Afghanistan, which you have nowhere else, and this is just sheer luck, this is not due to the Taliban, um, the meth meth methamphetamine production is actually a very, if you know what you do, not super complicated chemical process. You don't need any poppy fields for that. You just need household chemicals, except one component. And that component is the ephedra. Uh, ephedrine. 
That ephedrine is a highly controlled substance. That's why when you go to an American CVS or a German pharmacy and you buy certain kinds of cough syrup, you only get one, maximum two bottles because they have eph ephedrine in there. And if you extract that, you could make meth and other, or, and other drugs. Now, Afghanistan is the only country that I know of on the globe where you have a natural source of ephedrine. The Oman bushel grows in 2,500 uh, 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 meters height. Um, it's easy to harvest, grows naturally. You can mill it, dry it, and then you have a natural source of ephedrine, ephedra. Now, again, there is discussions that the ephedra markets have gone down, yadi, yadi, yadi. I would put a reserve to that because what we see is an increase of outflow of methamphetamine from Afghanistan. And why do we see this? Because the American Navy, the same, by the way, the name, same task force that is now well, the partner task force, but also headquartered in Bahrain, um, that is now providing the ships for the task force against the Houthis in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. That task force for the last 20 years has a counterterrorism mandate, which includes seizing shipments of drops out of Afghanistan. And as far as I understand from the public announcement on their website, they have not seen a significant drop in the shipments of um, uh, heroin on the one hand, but they did see a significant increase of the shipment of amphetamine. So out of Afghanistan, amphetamine is more. So we can discuss, you know, all the various regions and the fields are there and the fields are not there. I'm looking at the outflow. And if the outflow is the same, sorry, somewhere in Afghanistan, it must be produced. Maybe you're not looking in the right region. I don't know. For all of those who, who say the Taliban are now um, all of a sudden turning around and their main income source for the last 20 years and the main income source and cash cow of the Afghan economy is the one income source they really want to cut because, you know, there's so much firewood in Afghanistan that they can definitely substitute this. We've tried this for 20 years with a lot of money to substitute the drug economy and we're unsuccessful because simply nothing else makes us much money. And as I said, all of the mineral resources in Afghanistan are wonderful that they're there. There is no real railroad system. There is no real factory system. There is no real access to large scale ports where you can actually commercially viable exploit those so, uh, resources. The Chinese have been trying for a decade to do so and have not been able um, to do this in a commercially viable manner. So if the Chinese with a long strategic view are not able to do this, no other company in the region will be able to do this. So you have drugs or you have nothing in Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, well, the, the smuggling routes have been well established and are not only being used for drugs now, but um, uh, <laughs> guns and people and um, other hugely exploitable um, uh, goods. Um, I think there have been uh, quite a number of reported seizures of, of, uh, of meth, um, Rotterdam, for instance, or here yeah. in Australia, where I am at the moment, um, other parts of uh, of Europe. So there does seem to be um, a greater outflow. If um, uh, why would you not? Everywhere yeah. else, you have to go through great pains to get access to ephedra. This is a super high risk component for you as the truck producer because it's very much controlled. Because everyone in the world understands this is the co key component. In but you Afghanistan, don't even need the plant. Yeah, it grows. It grows on the mountain. Yes, right? indeed. So, you can just pick it. That's right. But you don't even need to do that when you have big farmer next door in Pakistan and just up the north. I think Uzbekistan is also um, a source of um, of inputs that that for meth. Um, but also the one of the um, impacts of of greater meth production is going to be on um, farmers. It's not easy to switch out of a high return crop that is pretty easy to grow, like poppy, to. Yeah, but for the Taliban, this is a perfect situation, mm. right? So the Taliban want to show the world, the international community, mm. all those embassies in Kabul, including the European Union representation there, that they're doing something, right? So you take your BBC reporter, because what you said was very beautiful, reported seizures inside Afghanistan, right? They make sure that they don't let the BBC reporter travel, you know, wherever he wants, but he's definitely allowed to go to every poppy seizure and burning of poppy fields that there is in Afghanistan to write a wonderful report about it, yeah. right? The perfect thing about the meth thing is, is that if you look at this from an organizational point of view, and I said, 
the Taliban, the last thing they really care is about ordinary Afghans, right? 20 years, they have killed 10,000 civilians on the Afghan side. Every single year is documented by the UN. No one can tell me that from 21 August, uh, from August 21 onwards, all of a sudden the Taliban discovered their great love for their countrymen, which were they happy to kill just a day earlier. Right. So that's not their concern, as long as it doesn't create a crisis in which there is a revolutionary movement. But they have pretty much disarmed most parts of the country, as they did in the 1990s. So what revolution? One side has the gun, the other side doesn't have guns. Right. Yeah. Um, as long as there's no the revolution, whether Afghan farmers have something to eat is not really a concern of the Taliban at all. No one can tell me that you're happy to kill the guy and then the next day you're very concerned that he has something to eat. So you can get more money. By having amphetamine, because you don't need to pay the farmer, you don't have to feel, you don't have the embarrassment of the international community saying everything is full of poppy fields here. You just need a laboratory. Very easy to hide, um, very, very uh, comparatively easy to operate and um, very difficult to find. So, yes, you can burn poppy plants and you can still earn more money than you did before because the production costs of meth once you got the chemicals, are much cheaper than paying a farmer for a year to, to harvest crops, right? So bigger return on investment um, and much less embarrassment because much harder to detect. Uh, so um, uh, the Taliban as a, um, as a nefarious influence regionally and globally is back big time. Well, look, I mean, for the time being, we'll have to live with the fact that they're back in power. That's simply a fact. Um, we will not remove them because I don't see the political will to go back to Afghanistan now or anytime soon. Um, there is, unfortunately, this time in 2001, there was a weak internal opposition. Now there really isn't any internal opposition. Unfortunately, the National Front is so small, they can annoy the Taliban, but not more than that. As in the 90s, the Taliban opposition outside Afghanistan, unfortunately, is really divided. Again, you have a million different people wanting a million different political systems. They don't seem to be able to agree on one vision, even agreeing on the vision of how to get rid of the Taliban. Mm. And uh, ISKP is not an internal opposition. So they're not really in Afghanistan to take, I mean, they say when you are monitoring their social media outputs on a daily basis, right? Um, they say they want to, you know, do a real emirate in Afghanistan. They don't even have the capacity to run a country, right? So that's not the idea. The idea is to use Afghanistan very clearly as a staging post to attack outside Afghanistan and every once in a while annoy the Taliban. So there is really no physical or political threat to the Taliban regime that I can see that has any realistic chance of removing. So we kind of have to live with it. My argument is we just shouldn't be blue-eyed and, uh, you know, not recognizing that these guys have dealt with us for the last 22 years intensively fighting a negotiation. They understand if a Western diplomat walks into the office of the interior minister what he should say and what he shouldn't say. Most of them don't speak the language anyway, so you have a translator who says whatever the line's supposed to be. We shouldn't be naive. These guys have not changed their ideological positions. I, I mentioned this to you, to you before. My, my most famous scene is the very first press conference of the Taliban once they've taken over Kabul. And the Taliban uh, spokesperson, Mujahid, said one and only one true sentence in his life. And that was the first answer to the first question. So learning curve of the Taliban, they let the first question be asked by a Afghan female journalist. At that time, they were still allowed to work. And her first question is, Everyone says Taliban 2.0, have you changed? And if you have changed, how? And he says, we obviously, if you're talking about ideology, we haven't changed. We were Muslims, we are Muslims, everything is the same. Now, this was the only moment of absolute and total truth that that man had in his life uh, when he was speaking publicly. Of course, they haven't changed. How can you change if your ideology is a, a religious one? And if there are religious tenets, and if the only source of legitimacy is your supreme leader, you cannot change. There is no practicality. There is no compromise possible. So you can't change. Unfortunately, part of your ideology says there has to be an emirate. And an emirate cannot be border bound. 
why would you deprive the rest of the international community from the pleasures of going to paradise, right? And if the only way to go to paradise is to live this and only this life, then your ambition needs to be either by yourself or through friends and co or connections to spread your ideology. So if they haven't changed, that means they are just as dangerous as they were until 2001. As always, Hans, Jacob, thank you for your time. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. That was Hans Jacob Schindler, co-director of the Counter Extremism Project. He talked about the merry-go-round he's been on for decades, observing and reporting on the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and listening to the same attempts to whitewash their ideology and intentions. He's someone who really should be listened to by policymakers if global security is to be enhanced. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. That's all for now. I'm Lynn O'Donnell. Bye-bye.